Welcome to our monthly shallow dive on stocks we are buying. October's theme is sometimes the best stock to buy now is one you already own. That's right. That is a Peter Lynch saying. Yeah, Casey, this philosophy has helped us a lot over the years. Buying a stock, more of a stock that you already own. Uh, what's up with that? Why is that the theme for October? Yeah, after two months of terrible stock performance and tons of media hype about all sorts of dysfunction going on in the world, sometimes it's really hard to just stomach buying something new and unfamiliar. But buying and holding for the long term is the key to success, and familiarity sometimes help us to just hold our nose and buy when the news seems overwhelmingly bad. So for October, we're primarily focused on one chip stock, one software stock, and one shoe stock, or maybe I should say clog stock. Probably definitely clog, foam clogs. Okay, that was a big hint. Maybe a preview really quick for the coming week. So after we do this video with three shallow dives, we are aware of the air test systems earnings report that was late last week. We've gotten plenty of requests. We are on it, but we are taking our time per usual. We're not a breaking news outlet here, taking our time to digest what the report said. But ultimately what we found is the outlook for the current fiscal year didn't change much. Again, probably a big hint, but we will be covering air test systems later this week. Stay tuned for that. Okay, Casey, first stock. What's the first stock for October? Applied Materials. This is our first ever chip manufacturing equipment stock that we bought years ago. This is where we started, not with ASML, the so-called most important company in the semiconductor industry. We've hoped we've dispelled that myth a bit over the last month to show how ASML is part of a tightly coordinated ecosystem of companies that collaborate with including applied materials. Yeah, Casey, let's, let's show the folks the, hopefully by now, the familiar semiconductor industry flow chart, which you put together. Yeah, applied materials fits right in the center there with the chip manufacturing equipment and We've recently covered lithography, ASML, which we still do like and think could be a decent long-term value. We've covered how ASML is reliant on the photo mask equipment and photo mask makers, which are an interesting but underfollowed segment. Now, we've also covered most of the other metrology companies, those measurement, quality control, process control, and diagnostic companies via KLA Core, Onto Innovation, Nova, and Camtech, which we also like. Now you get a little bit of all of it in Applied Materials. Check out this chart that we borrow from Applied Materials many times here. You see Applied Materials represented in blue. It's on a lot of these different areas. So it's a generalist that covers a lot of bases. Right. Uh, the big generalist, the, the giant really, in semiconductor manufacturing equipment. So as we talk a lot about lots and lots of new fabs getting built and upgraded in the next few years, Applied Materials is probably going to be selling some sort of equipment to virtually all of them. So the stock is up big this year. We think in part because of this dynamic right here. They have flatlined, revenue has flatlined, but that's pretty good given that the, this niche of the semiconductor industry is down. Most peers, applied materials peers are down, but there are certain segments that are outperforming. One of them is like things related to automotive, like ion implantation. Again, we'll just reference that here in the second chart with the different types of equipment. Those are companies like Excellus Technologies, ACLS that applied materials competes with. Uh, you name it, no matter what kind of equipment you're looking for, it seems like Applied Materials has a solution. Uh, so they're all over, uh, including packaging, advanced packaging. Again, like you said, Casey, we covered the metrology companies quite a bit because of the advanced packaging 
applied materials plays there as well. Let's talk a little bit though about the really big reason we think this company is up a lot this year and it's free cash flow. So when we discussed applied materials this time last year at the bottom of the market, we said that we thought free cash flow was going to soar for this company. Years and years of investment starting to pay off. And that's exactly what's happened. $7 billion in free cash flow generated in the last trailing 12-month period. That compares to just $4.6 billion in the trailing 12-month period ended in fiscal 2022. So it's something interesting that happened during the market bottom. Applied Materials funneled a ton of cash into stock repurchases, including from off of their balance sheet. And a lot of you viewers expressed concern with that balance sheet because it had more debt than cash as a result of that. But as the stock price has come up and some of the extreme value has gone away, the company actually pivoted away from repurchases and replenished its balance sheet. As of the end of July, Applied Materials had $6.5 billion in cash and short-term investments. $5.7 billion in long-term investments and just $2.2 billion in debt. So you see the flip there. Last year, stock is depressed. They're repurchasing tons of it. This year, maybe there's still a value, but not as much of an extreme value as before. So they funnel the cash to the balance sheet. That's what I call incredibly high-quality capital allocation. We love this business long-term. Uh, Casey. Let's flip-flop. Uh, let's talk about the valuation. Yes. At less than 20 times forward price to earnings and free cash flow, we think maybe the market isn't fully understanding applied materials potential going forward. We'll see what happens in 2024, of course, but we're willing to buy some more after the pullback in the last two months. Let's move on to number two, Salesforce or CRM. Right. Another one that we've owned for a long time. In fact, I think probably our oldest cloud software purchase. Of course, we cover chip stocks here, but we still like software. And let me just rattle off a few other ideas that we do like this month. So we've talked in our community board. We do put our articles on that. And recently we've covered ServiceNow, ticker symbol NOW, N-O-W. UiPath, which we're warming back up to, ticker symbol PATH, P-A-T-H. And then also, if you want something really simple, the Vanguard Information Technology ETF, or VGT, which captures a lot of the mid and small cap stocks that the Invesco QQQ ETF, ticker symbol QQQ, doesn't catch because it's just the top 100 companies on the NASDAQ. VGT has 320 stocks in it. That's another one that we've also owned, I think even longer, that has done very, very well. It's obliterated the NASDAQ index. It's a great index. So just three more ideas other than Salesforce. Casey, what's up with CRM? What's going on? Yeah, we really like the 10% pullback from this year's highs. CRM is one of our oldest cloud software holdings, as Nick mentioned. And we plan on keeping this stock for the long term. That said, the CRM rebound story is still developing and is really contingent on further GAAP net income progress in 2024. We think GAAP, non-GAAP net income, and free cash flow will eventually converge. What happened here is years of bolt-on software acquisitions culminated with the big purchase of Slack in the summer of 2021, but expenses ballooned, which included upper management bloat and stock-based compensation. 2022 was the beginning of the rectifying of all of that. Co-founder and CEO Mark Benioff took the blame for this but many forget that he built a highly profitable business, especially using free cash flow per share, which accounts for that stock-based compensation dilution over the previous two decades. Yeah, we really believe Benioff still knows what he's doing. Some of the arguments we've seen against Salesforce in the last year include, uh, you know, well, he built this business on acquisitions. That's easy to do, to build a, a non-profitable business via acquisitions. Well, if it's that easy, I mean, 
wouldn't there be a lot more software companies with, you know, <laughs> tens of billions in revenue right now? Absolutely not the case. It's difficult to build a business, even if you do it by these bolt-on acquisitions to the, the core CRM business. And by the way, Casey, we've got uh, another chart here that we can show from our friends at uh, Main Street Data that show the free cash flow generation over time. Benioff absolutely does know how to make a business, a big business via acquisitions and also do so profitably. And again, on a, a free cash flow per share basis, it's been a growing profitable company. So there is work to do in 2024. We'll see how that goes. Benioff's getting some help in this department as they make this pivot though, right? Yeah, it seems like he's taking some advice from the playbook of Oracle co-founder and CTO Larry Ellison. And we can remember that Benioff started his career there. So Ellison is now a top three richest person after big bets on NVIDIA AI and Oracle Cloud. Ellison talks a lot about doing more with less, a skill that we really believe Salesforce can apply in this new X growth period where expanding profit margins and stock buybacks will be more important than ever. Right, right. Maybe just one brief uh, point on this, Casey, in this new AI era. Obviously, that's doing more with less is what this is all about, ultimately. That's what we're talking about whenever someone mentions AI trying to do more with less. And we know some of this iteration of computing technology embodied in AI is very unfair, favors big businesses with deep pockets and tons of data. It's difficult to get it to work if you don't have the deep pockets, if you don't have treasure troves of data. Unfortunately, that's just where we're at right now which is another reason we think Salesforce is a good pick for this current market environment. They have been very quick in applying new AI into their software suite. So what's the valuation for CRM? Okay. Yeah. Speaking of gap profit margins, gap net income profit margins, they're low. And as a result, trailing 12-month price to earnings is 130x as of this recording. However, Casey, you already said, this story is about 2024, and Wall Street fully expects Benioff to deliver on this front. Because if, if you factor for the profit margin expansion into next year, stock actually only trades for 22 times expected price to earnings. So a couple of assumptions here, we think about 10% revenue growth can be sustained in the next year. Maybe it accelerates a bit more, and that would be a good thing. And, but again, lots of upside if the company can boost its profit margins, repurchase stock. Oh, also, by the way, it also trades for just 27 times trailing 12-month free cash flow. We think this is a good deal on a company that we think will continue to grow at a steady pace for a long time to come. Number three, Croc stock. Now, last month, we bought ONON on holding on running shoe. This month, we're going back to my number two favorite shoe, Crocs. So more market freak out over Hey Dudes going from hyper growth to basically no growth, at least according to Crocs management for the back half of this year. We can blame the closing of non-strategic Hey Dude distribution contracts in favor of keeping the casual shoes within the existing Crocs distribution channels. It should boost profitability going forward, but it is causing sales to stumble. Right. Yeah. That, we'll come back to that in a moment. But there's another thing going on here as well that we think may have caused Crocs stock to tank the last couple of months. So you can see here from the stock chart, much more dramatic than even the last two stocks that we talked about. We think the other thing at play here is soaring interest rates. The 10-year treasury yield is up to 4.7%, 4.8%. Oftentimes, the market uses that interest rate when valuing the fair value, the current present fair value of a stock. And remember, higher interest rates are like a weight on the valuation of, of a company. I guess if you're a Croc shareholder, <laughs> blame the Fed. One of the big reasons why this has a big effect on Crocs is because of that balance sheet I remember they took out a lot of debt to acquire Hey Dudes. 
So at the end of this past summer, at the end of Q2 2023, two billion in debt, only 166 million in cash and short-term investments, exactly what we are not typically interested in investing in. So the exception, what's the exception? Crocs has best-in-class profitability with its manufacturing, supply chain, and growing online business, the direct-to-consumer business model. Operating margins are well north of 20%, approaching 30% these days. $750 million in free cash flow over the last year, about 20% of the revenue. It's pretty darn good for such a high-growth apparel business that's been integrating that new big acquisition. Debt is going to be worked down before too long, and management said bigger stock repurchases could commence before long. A modest $50 million was repurchased in Q2 of this year, 2023. One other thing, I think maybe we started here with the financials, Casey, but is worth mentioning, is when we're looking for consumer goods businesses to invest in, it's a very, very different approach that we take than when we're looking at chip stocks, and even software stocks. Brand awareness and brand strength is super important. And this is what we like about Crocs. Despite obviously the balance sheet being less than perfect, but as you said, profit margins will work that out eventually. Brand strength. So when Crocs came out in the early 2000s, it was like kids' shoes, right? Little kids' shoes. And nurses. Casey would definitely know about that. So when they made their debut in the 2000s, though, a lot of sales for kids. Those kids have grown up and they're still wearing Crocs. They're also now buying them for their kids. And that's not a fad. That's one of the arguments we hear about Crocs right now. This is a fad. It's going to die off. Absolutely not. This is not a fad. Multi-decade popularity is not a fad. Okay. I think hopefully we can all agree on that. Another story that we like about this business that we've talked about in the past is Asia. Big opportunity in Asia. This is virtually untapped still at this point for Crocs, where in many markets in Asia, if you've ever been there, if you spend any amount of time there, especially in Southeast Asia, where it's pretty hot and steamy, comfort, utility, ease of, of cleaning is of utmost importance. And so we think a lot of these markets, like Crocs is the perfect shoe, and there's actually plenty of knockoffs over there floating around already. So why not get the OG in there? And they're working on it. So the last quarter was not the best quarter for growth in Asia, but they still managed 39% sales growth year over year in Q2 2023. Not bad considering the sluggish recovery in China earlier this year. We're doing our part to keep Croc sales alive. Nick and I just purchased some new Hey Dudes. And my next favorite shoe is Birkenstock. So I think we're going to have to talk about that IPO at some point. We'll so, talk about the IPO. Yeah. But let's talk about the risk for Crocs because there is some risk. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's the debt. The debt is definitely an issue, whether or not they can get that paid down. And then again, going back to Hey Dudes, I think what we really need to monitor is no growth going to become the norm for that acquisition, or can they re-accelerate expansion of Hey Dudes next year? It looks like Gen Z are big fans of Hey Dude shoes as well. We'll have to keep an eye on that. Also, it would be nice to see further profit margin expansion if the business is indeed slowing down, if it's not going to grow as much as it has the last few years. So I think those are the risks. The upshot though, I think, is the valuation, which looks dirt cheap. Nick, the investor 15 years ago, loved dirt cheap stocks. I've kind of moved beyond that, but let's talk about the valuation for a second anyways. Yeah, eight times trailing 12 month price to earnings, 6.5 times Price to earnings based on the 2024 estimates, seven times trailing 12 month free cash flow. So, with all that debt and uncertainty around Hey Dude growth next year, it does seem like this makes sense that it has such a cheap valuation. But the valuation at this point looks downright depressed to us. So, that's why we're adding to our position in this one. 
And we did buy this the last time it was depressed in 2022 as well. Yeah, this really looks like a repeat of last summer in some ways. The market giving up on Croc stock, and I don't think we're ready to yet. I'm not. No, okay. Those are the three stocks we are definitely purchasing in October. The last few videos, we mentioned some other small cap stocks that we are interested in. We'll, of course, keep you up to date if we decide to pull the trigger in any of those cheap chip stocks for the fourth quarter of 2023. Again, later this week, stay tuned for the air test systems update as well. A lot of interesting info happening there. And of course, more stuff coming from Semiconductor World. We'll see you again soon at Chipstock Investor slash Roadshow. <laughs>